Chapter 11 A Day in the Life One of the great misconceptions from the days of the brothers themselves to today is that magic is somehow marvelous and wonderful and that being a mage is some type of glorious adventure. In truth, magic is just a study in forces, albate forces that are undetected by the common man, and most of the work of a mage is not involved in deadly spell casting duels, but in wearisome study, tiresome memorization, and unending research. Our call, our Gavian scholar. Barl led Joda to a small room off the main hallway. The room contained two beds, and Barl informed Joda that the other bed would be for another first year student should one suddenly present himself at the gate. Barl ordered measurements to be taken by the torque wearing servants for proper clothing, and he left the youth to bathe and prepare for food. A pitcher of warm water and a bowl had been provided, along with towels, and Joda scrubbed himself mercilessly to rid himself of the last of the salt and grime before climbing between the fresh iron sheets and falling fast asleep. He awoke to find both his robes and his tattered ragged garb missing, replaced by new garments that fitted him well, but not snugly. There was a blue shirt made of what felt like silk and slightly darker pants made of light wool. A vest of purple was provided with large copper buttons. The quiet and effective servants had left his boots, but have cleaned them of the mud and dried them thoroughly. Joda stuck his head out the door and looked around. The interior hall was windowless, but small lamps were set in alcoves every few yards. At first, Joda thought them to be candles in glass chimneys, but closer inspection proved them to be nothing less than imitations, their wicks and flames instead being tear shaped gems that glimmered with their own lights. Joda found the idea fascinating, and he did not hear his assailant until it was too late. A massive hand impacted on his right shoulder, nearly forcing Joda into the wall. As he stumbled forward, another meaty palm raised up to steady him. Didn't mean to surprise you, said his attacker, cheerfully sandwiching the young man between his huge paws. His assailant was a huge man, but just as Barl was small and had an aura of largest about him, this one was big and looked less impressive for his size. His belly spilled over the top of his belt and his untucked shirt strained at the lower buttons. He had more of a beard than Joda in that it covered most of his face, but it seemed less since there were huge ball spots in areas covered only by one or two strands of overlong hair. The dirty white hair on his head was stringy and drooped in front of his sparkling eyes. Indeed, his eyes seemed like the only parts of him that were fresh and awake. They sent me to wake you and drag you down to breakfast. Come on. He let go of Joda and quickly trundled down the hall. Halfway to the stairs, he shouted over his shoulder. Bitter serving ham. Joda blinked and unsure of himself, patted after his cheerful compatriot. By the time he was halfway down the hall, his new friend was at the stairway, and as he reached down the stairs, Joda could hear the large man slapping the bottom steps with his oversized boots. It was fortunate that the staircase led out directly on the dining hall, or Joda would have never found breakfast at all. By the time he arrived, his new companion had already plowed through the buffet line and was ensconced behind the heavy laden platter of biscuits, gravy, griddle cakes, eggs prepared a number of different ways, and berries that clung to the side of the towering mass of food like mountain climbers fearing an avalanche. And there was ham, of course. Joda took a few pieces of ham, a soft roll, and two griddle cakes. He considered the thick syrupy coffee, but settled for an infusion of sweet oak leaves poured by one of the torque servants. As he moved away from the line, Joda looked for somewhere to sit along the populated breakfast tables. He caught a now familiar flash of dirty white hair, but had no time to react because his large assailant was waving with both arms, on the off chance that Joda did not see him. Joda set down his plate opposed the huge man, who he had already mentally dubbed the happy juggernaut. The man shoved the remains of a gravy-soaked biscuit in his mouth and held out a sticky hand. But the way, I'm Juna, he barbled, the crumbs dripping down his shirt. Joda looked at the hand, and the other man realized his faux paw. He quickly grasped a portion of the tablecloth, his napkin having vanished, presumably eaten, swallowed it, and tried again. By the way, he said, I'm Shannon. I was told that you were the new kid, and I should help you settling in. You want that roll? Joda said Shannon could take it, and it was a good thing, because the large man had already taken possession of the pastry before Joda had finished giving permission. Nothing short of a fork in the back of the hand would have driven him away from the biscuit, if that. Joda introduced himself and asked what sort of help a new student such as himself, 
might need that friend Shannon could provide. Make sure you know where the meals are. In the heads, said the happy juggernaut, mixing his words with the energetic chomping of his breakfast. Perhaps they closed the hall after an hour, thought Joda, and that was why he had to eat so fast. And get you to the library. They told me that as well. You're working in the library. Do you work in the library, friend Shannon? said Joda, almost fearing the reply. Shannon, his mouth filled with several somethings, shook his head, then held up a finger for Joda to wait until he managed to swallow his mouth full down. I work for Borrow. Well, actually one of Borrow's assistants. I just got promoted. I'm working on making little gears out of near fright. That's a hard type of jade, you know. Joda nodded, then asked, Why are you making jade gears? Nifrite, said Shannon. I don't know, but Borrow wants it for something big. That's the way it is around here. There's always something going on around here, and we only get to know the small bits. But if you listen, you can pick stuff up. Look over there. Joda followed the sausage-sized finger to where two figures in robes, male and female, were speaking in low whispers. Ophenia and San Lo, said Shannon, not bothering to explain which was which. Two months ago, they hated each other, to the point that everyone feared that open spell combat would break out in the halls, or at least an official challenge in the arena. Then Burrow comes back from one of his trips with a magical whatsis, a dark sphere made of unknown wood. San Lo wants it, but Burrow signs Ophenia to research it. But all the books that Ophini needs are in Lowe's private stock. So the two of them have been kissy faced for the past couple weeks, with one trying to get the books and the other trying to get the sphere. Won't last, of course. But I think Burrow was hoping to get the two to stop acting like rival cats. Worked, at least so far. Joda looked at the table. All he saw was two people, male and female, talking over small cups of coffee. He saw neither fighting cats nor kissing faces but took Shannon at his word. Exhausted by the long dissertation, Shannon plunged back into his meal, surfacing only to deliver some other bit of gossip. Drusilla, according to Shannon, attained the color of her night black hair through use of certain plants growing in the southern swamp. Dorine was the name of the white-haired woman, and she had a taste for young male servants. So did Lord Dervish, but he had a better taste than she did. Jonko, a red mage, was not present at the moment, but had a talent for humiliating the staff publicly. Orm, also absent, was said to be wasting away in a study, refusing all meals in a quest for higher consciousness. And Lucan, the fat man who Joda had met the day before in the hallway, was by general consensus a blatant backside kisser. Joda noticed that there was nothing about Borrow or Marisol in Shannon's listing of gossip. It doesn't pay to talk about one's boss. Shannon patted the last of the gravy from the corner of his mouth, missing some, and smearing the rest in his patchy beard. Besides, Burrow's the one that makes everything work around here. He's the chief artificer, but he's also the one who makes sure that everything is functioning properly. If something or someone needs to be replaced, he does the replacing. He gave me this task, making the gears, after the last guy had a nasty accident, broke two of his left fingers in a vice. What about the Lord High Mage? said Joda. He's not your boss. He's my boss's boss. So what I said is doubly true, said Shannon. But there are things that one knows if one knows how to listen. He paused for a moment, trying to affect a knowing grin, but only managing a soppy leer, then said, You want the rest of your ham? Shannon finished the last of Joda's breakfast, and Joda thought his large, cheerful companion might charge a buffet to get seconds. Instead, the huge man said, Come on, I'll show you the library. You gotta have a good memory around here, because the rooms make no sense whatsoever, and Borrow forbids maps. Joda shot Shannon a puzzled look, which brought about another story. The way I heard it is that two mages were mapping the place, starting at opposite corners. When they got to the center of the old monastery, nothing matched up, and they got into a fight. They were finding bits of the two of them for weeks afterward in the hallway. Anyway. That's the story I heard. So Borrow says no maps. He's got the gift for simple, straightforward solutions that way. Here we are. The library turned out to be the common or shared library for the Citadel. 
Most of the established mages had their own private libraries as well, Shannon noted, and guarded them like rabid wolves. In the shared library were the materials that were held in common stock, books that were obviously non-magical, generic references, and items newly recovered from the hinterlands or left to the shelves by departed mages. Shannon abandoned Joda to the care of a deeply wrinkled woman who ruled the library from behind a redoubt of potted plants set on her desk. She said her name was Netta and informed him that it was short for Nedastophilites. He paused for a moment, as if expecting him to recognize the name. When he didn't, her eyes narrowed, and Joda had no doubt that her opinion of his intelligence dropped by at least ten points. You'll be working in the scriptorium, said Netta sharply, walking toward the back of the library. I'm not very good at writing, volunteered Joda. Netta pulled up short and gave him that same intelligence shrinking look. Writing isn't necessary. You know how to work a scarab. Joda stammered for a moment, then said that he had seen one work, but had not used it himself. She nodded and walked over to a side desk, pulled out a scarab, a quill, and ink. She showed him in short, deft movements, how to fill the scarab, where to place it on the paper, and how to deactivate it when he was done. Some scarabs made a noise when they reached the bottom, a buzzing or a peeping. They didn't, so you had to watch them out of the corner of your eye, or they would just stop when they ran out of paper. The big thing, she said, was not to hem and haw and not to stutter. You don't stutter, do you? She said, her eyes narrowing again in challenge. Joda said no, and she brightened just a touch. Good. I had a stutterer once. Worked here three months before we figured out no one could read what he had dictated. And we only found out because one of the red wizards blew herself up going through one of the texts he had transcribed. Damn fools. Both of them. She led Joda across the room to beneath a great window made of panels and prisms of glass. The window overlooked the force, or it would have, if there was not a pounding rain at the moment that riled the glass in its fixtures and threatened to break in any moment. Stacked at the base of the window were books of all shades and sizes, large elephant folios and tiny pocket books, ancient scrolls and runes carved into clay tablets. Some were incised on bones, and several were scribbled on a metal disc. There were all manner of traditional books as well, bound in leather, cloth, metal, and several substances that Joda could only guess at. Nadastaphilides set down the scarab and the ink and opened a drawer in the table to reveal a deep bin of parchment. You read aloud. The scarab writes. You finish the book. You go to the next one. Joda looked at the huge amount of books. Where should I start? Netta shrugged. Start anywhere. They all have to be done eventually. And with that, she wheeled and went back to her desk. Joda looked at her returning form, then at the pile of books. He picked up one volume, but the handwriting was badly crabbed and the water stains along the bottom, rendering almost unreadable. He set that aside and chose a smaller tome. This one was filled with a more elegant hand and seemed to be a diary of some type. He returned to the table, set up the scarab to record his words, and started to read. It took a little time to get used to. He had to speak loudly and clearly enough for the scarab to register without undue pauses or using the wrong word or stuttering. Joda made a few mistakes early and put aside one entire sheet that was too error-filled for him to tolerate. About mid-morning, the scarab went out of ink without him noticing it, and Joda had to reread a section again after making that discovery. Netta came over twice. First, she reviewed a finished page and made Joda record it again. The second time, she gave an approving snort and retreated back to her plants. About the time his stomach started grumbling, around noonday, Shannon reappeared with a hearty smile and a sack full of food. Netta gave a glare that went past disapproving and ventured into the realm of homicidal, but the happy juggernaut ignored her gaze entirely. He set down the sack on the table, upsetting the scarab in the process and smearing the page. Joda sighed and asked what was going on. Lunch, said the artificer, the fresh stains on his shirt bearing witness to that basic truth. It's catch as catch can around here, but there will always be something in the kitchen. And if you're involved, you can always ring for a servant to bring you something. Joda looked at Netta for confirmation of that fact, 
but the woman sat there stone face, glowering at the huge invader to her realm. You sound a little hoarse, said Shannon, digging through the bag. Scripters usually get that way. So I brought some hard candies. They're real good, and they help. A rainbow of sweets clattered to the table. Shannon also brought some biscuits, ham slices left over from breakfast, some dried fruits, and some slices of black bread with raisins as well. He consumed half of what he had brought as Joda ate his portion. When the food was gone, Shannon pushed himself back away from the crumb laden table and declared, Back to gears for me. I'll stop before dinner to get you. And don't let our lady of the potted plants work you too hard. The rule here is that you should work at your own pace, as long as the work gets done. And with that, Shannon was gone, leaving Joda to regard the huge pile of unread tomes. Joda sighed, swept the crumbs from the table into his hand, disposed of them, then returned to his work. Joda took two breaks in the afternoon. The first was to find the nearest water closet, and the other was to check something in the history section. The books on the shelves were roughly grouped by subject, with histories in one area, diaries in another, spell text in a third, and an overstuffed abandoned area labeled holy text. Joda finished the slender diary that afternoon and went on to a larger text about shipping in the shielded sea. As he read aloud, his memory slipped back to the storm and to the merfolk and to Sima. He suppressed a shudder as he thought of the cold water closing over him and had to check the scarab to make sure that his reaction was not committed to paper. The second text contained a number of foreign words that Joda did not recognize, but he found that if he spelled them out, the recorder would handle them. That made him feel better as well. The book was intriguing, but long, and Joda was only half done before Shannon arrived to drag him to dinner. Joda placed a marker in the book and cleaned the scarab as Netta had instructed him, and then he packed it away. On their way out of the library, Joda paused by the plant-strewn desk. He said, Nadasta Philides was the last warrior queen of the now-lost Zegon before they were ruled by a council. She died 50 years before Urza was born, and her reign was regarded as a golden age of the Zagoni people, winning them their freedom from the main Falaji rulers of that time, the Tomoku. Netta looked up at him, her face still a block of deeply carved stone, but there was a light in her green eyes. You have had a very good first day, friend Joda. Thank you, good lady Netta. Friend Netta, corrected the librarian. Friend Netta, said Joda, and hurried after Shannon who was already barreling down the hallway as if he had to hunt down and capture dinner with his bare hands. You'll have to hurry if you're going to dress, said Shannon, as Joda cut off with him. Dress? said Joda. What's wrong with what I'm wearing? Nothing, said Shannon. If you're going to be working through dinner, the servants will bring you sandwiches and cold soup. Go to your room. Your evening outfit is probably already laid out. Indeed it was placed there by the same invisible servant who had transformed his trail-spattered gear into silk finery, leggings of a rich, royal blue, a short tunic of similar material edged in gold thread, a long cape which closed at the neck with a golden clasp in the shape of a seashell, long gloves. His boots would seem clunky and heavy with this outfit, and the mystery servant had provided a set of silk slippers. Joda regarded himself in the thin silver mirror inside the door and was impressed. His hair seemed a little shaggy now, and there was probably a barber or other servant who could take care of that as well. Shannon was waiting for him outside his room. He was dressed in an outrageous class of multicolored checks and stripes that made it difficult to pin down exactly where he ended and the real world began. Despite his anxiousness, Shannon now said there was no real rush. Dinner was a formal affair. There would be assigned seating, again arranged by ubiquitous and invisible servants. Shannon, of course, was seated to Joda's right, so that at least Joda did not have to watch the ill-conceived spawn of fashion eat. To Joda's left was a balding, much older mage, who spent much of the meal talking to himself and making notes on a small tablet. The tables were laid out like a wide horseshoe. The diners occupied the outer ring, while servants beetled around making sure the glasses were filled and the plates sufficiently laden. Joda tested his drink with a small sip, before risking a larger gulp, and as he did so, he saw the white-haired woman, Doreen, at the opposite end of the horseshoe, watching him. He offered her a small toast, and she returned it. Then, she turned to her companion, a very pale man with very blonde hair, 
and quickly locked him down in intense conversation. Shannon said there was about 250 mages at the Conclave at any time, with more coming and going all the time. Only about half of them would be at dinner at any one time, since many had their own work to do. They were all levels of capability, ranging from the new fish like himself and Joda, up to those with their own suites and private laboratories. Some were out in the field uncovering new magical items, though there were fewer and fewer of those these days. There probably were at least as many servants, though Shannon never bothered to count them. Barl probably knew, he said, but then Barl knew everything about the Conclave Citadel. The central area of the horseshoe was used for magical display at the whims of the diners. Fresh apples were served with the main course, and one mage threw his core in the center of the room. Joda wondered at it, until the seeds within the core quickly sprouted, their stalks entwining and growing thicker and more woody, until a full apple tree stood in the center of the tables, bearing golden fruit. The apples dropped from the tree. Each one became a shimmering bell on its way to the ground, striking the marble floor to play out a rough, chiming tune. The assembled mages applauded as the servants brought out a sherbet, dodging the roots as they wove around the tree. The mage who had cast the core bowed deeply and cast another spell, shriveling the tree and causing it to contract on itself until it became nothing more than an apple core, which a deathly servant picked up and carried from the hall. Romeron does that sort of thing all the time, said Shannon, pointing with a turkey leg at the green-clad mage. A food fight also broke out across the arch of the horseshoe as one of the wizards, filled with black mana, animated a turkey carcass and sent it on an attack spree, charging along the far arc of the table with an oversized knife clenched beneath one wing, a carving fork in the other. Some of the diners leaned away as the half-card corpse surged by them, but several mages organized a resistance from the bread baskets. Several long loaves, half cut through, accordion their way forward, supported on the flanks by waves of animated dinner rolls. The two forces met almost directly across from Joda's position, near where Durant sat. The white-haired mages abandoned her seat entirely as the animated pit of poultry slammed into the doughy legions. Shannon provided a vivid and excited description of the battle to anyone with an earshot. And the death turkey goes wading into the middle of the dinner rolls. Their buttery interiors are no match for blazing silverware. And the poultry guys is carving them to pieces. Oh, there are crumbs everywhere. But wait, the long loaves are now in position. And they're raising up like cobras. And slamming themselves down on the reanimated turkey. They're striking it again and again. And not giving the bird a chance to regain its breath. Yes. Yes. It is all over everyone. The big goods have carried the field. The yeast also rises. Huzzah! Huzzah! The servants, who wisely disappeared during the confrontation, reappeared to clean up the worst of the debris and bring out the dessert. There's always good entertainment. Would borrow, and his high mages aren't here, said Shannon, slurring his words slightly. He nodded toward the apex of the horseshoe, and indeed, there was a pair of empty chairs that Joda had not noticed before. Is there a reason for that? said Joda. Don't they approve of mages playing with their food? Ah, dessert, said Shannon, ignoring Joda's comment entirely. You have to try the cheesecake. It is to die for. The cheesecake was the best thing Joda had ever placed on his tongue. It seemed to melt in a cool sensation that passed through the rest of his body. Idly, he wondered if there were mages in the kitchen as well. Joda allowed himself another glass of the wine and noticed that Shannon was partial to small shots of whiskey one after another. Then, the servants opened the doors behind Marisol's and Barl's empty chairs, and one announced that there would be poetry and spells in the smoking room. Shannon arose from the table, trying to take Joda with him. The good seats always go first, he enthused. Joda gently disengaged his arm. It's been a long day, he said diplomatically. I think I want to spend some time thinking, then turn in early. Shannon blinked at the concept of thought as a planned activity. At least he managed, okay, and plowed toward the doors. See you at breakfast, he shouted over his shoulder. Most of the company was heading for the smoking room. The white-haired woman was apparently stalking one of the waiters, and the old man next to Joda was still scribbling on his pad, half his meal untouched in front of him. Joda stretched and made his way up to a small room. He passed a few open doors, from which laughter, and in one case singing, emerged. At last, he reached his, for the moment, private room. 
He stripped and washed and crawled between the sheets. Even more than yesterday, the soft bed linens felt luxuriant. He was safe. He had a roof over his head. He was well fed. He was working with mages. There were no goblins here. No city guard. No church. He finally found a place that appreciated magic. It had been a very good day, thought Joda. As the tendrils of sleep reached up to snare him, he managed one last thought. He thought, I could get used to this. Barl knocked softly, but firmly, and entered the private study, expecting the Lord High Mage to be hunched over his stone calendar with his sand-filled glasses. Instead, Marisol was at his desk, books piled high around him. At the center of the maelstrom was the thin folder holding three pieces of paper detailing the interview with Joda. You called for me, my lord mage, said the artificer. Marisol looked up and smiled at Barl, a smile that told the artificer at once that the Lord High Mage had discovered something and was very pleased by his discovery. Barl had seen the expression before. Marisol was a master at assigning mages five separate and apparently unrelated tasks, only to take their results as a group and come to a conclusion that none had anticipated. How goes matters with the new arrival? said Marisol brightly. As per your instructions, he was assigned to the library as a scripter, said Barl calmly. I assigned one of my junior apprentices to help him settle in. May I ask why the interest in this particular majoring? Marisol smiled again and chuckled. He tapped the report. Joda of Giva Province, he said. Student of the now deceased Fosca, a name that means nothing to either of us. But the transcript states that there was a mage in the family line. He took a deep breath and thought for a moment. Jarsal. He said he had a great-grandfather named Jarsal. You mentioned this before. Great-great-grandfather, corrected Marisol. Now take a look at this. The taller man spun the large, open text around on the desk. It was a copy of the Antiquities War by Caleb and Krug. Barl had only seen four original copies of the work the one he himself had brought from the south, and three later copies that he had ordered destroyed over the years to keep out of other hands. The page in question was held open by a large brass bookmark. The passage Marshall pointed to was toward the end of the volume. Barl read, and Marshall waited quietly. It speaks of the time when the devastation reached Argive, been Krug's home at that time, said Barl, when the great explosion that her husband Urza summoned to defeat his brother reached his homeland thousands of miles away. It still had enough force to level towers and breach stone walls. Look at the marginal note, the one I believe to be in Kayla's handwriting, said Marisol. Barl squinted, then nodded. It looks like a mention of a Jarsal, and this one's Kayla's grandson, and no more than a child. It said the blast frightened him. And Giva province was once the nation of Argive, said Marisol. Barl looked up. You think that the Jarsal of the Brothers War is the boy's ancestor. Marisol held his hands before him and turned both palms to the ceiling as if he was physically weighing the options. Then he smiled. It seems very likely. Jarsal of Giva Province is the boy's great whatever grandsire. Jarsal of Argive was Urza's grandson. Therefore, he raised both palms toward the Barl. It seems like a coincidence, said Barl flatly. He had been down this type of road with Marisol. Usually he had been proved wrong. Marisol would often look at the collection of facts and come up with the conclusion that was not the most likely, but was usually the true one. A coincidence worth pursuing, said Marisol. He sat back on his high back chair and folded his hands over his stomach, fiddling with his ruby ring as he did so. Barl said, If you wish, we could get to the truth directly. The wand of pink quartz has proved to be more than adequate in gaining answers. Marisol looked up at the stocky man, his brows raised in mock surprise. Friend Barl, not every question needs to be answered with the hammer. And here I thought you liked that young man. Barl replied, I said, I believe he would adapt well to our group and that he holds promise. If he also holds peril, we should be prepared to deal with it directly and quickly. And besides, said Marisol, the wolfish grid returning to his face as he raised a theatrical palm. You know that if you suggest it, I would try something else. Oh, 
I have known you too long, friend Artificer. You make the assumption that I know you as well as you presume to know me, my lord high mage, said Barl, without hint of amusement. Marisol templed his fingers and touched him to his lips. He may not know he is the blood of Urza, he said at last. After all, the brothers are not the most popular roots to anchor one's family tree to. Still, if he has some of Urza's blood, and he is a mage, and he is the descendant of Jarsal, he let the phrase hang unanswered for a moment. I think I want to meet this lad, he said at last. I can arrange to have him brought here at once. Not like that, said Marisol, waving a hand in frustration. Hammers, borrow hammers! The boy has no family. He has no real friends. He has lost his mentor, and he falls into our laps. He is looking for someone to follow, someone to look up to. That someone would be you, I suppose, said Brawl flatly. Of course, said Marisol, the lupine smile tugging back the corners of his thin mustache. And once I have him, he'll be the key I need to solve my great mystery. I won't need if at all, will I? For I will have one of Urza's blood to unlock the door and bring me the power that is rightfully mine. Barl said nothing, but only nodded at the Lord High Mage's wisdom 